Hi, hello. Hopefully now I'm on stage. I'm sorry for that technical glitch, everybody. Um, so if you don't know where you are, uh, I didn't know where I was five minutes ago. You're with Rothamsted Research and we're about to talk about insect alert. Are we facing extinction? So I'm Madame Finley and for the next 30 minutes, as I said, we're going to be burrowing into the world of insects and asking, are they in trouble? Now, I know many of you might get the heebie-jeebies even thinking about creepy crawlies, but whether you're the type to run screaming from wasps and spiders or build a bug hotel and chase after butterflies, we can't get away from the fact that insects are incredibly important for us and our planet. There's somewhere in the region of one million species on the planet, from microscopic cat and dog fleas to the Goliath Atlas moss, which has a wingspan of up to 27 centimetres. Insects live on every continent, even Antarctica, proving that midges really do get everywhere. Without insects, we'd struggle to grow food. Not only do we need them to pollinate crops, but there are actually lots of insect predators eating the pests that munch their way through what we grow. Sadly, the last few years have seen many worrying headlines about insect declines. From four out of 10 species being under threat through to reports that all species have declined by 80% over the last 30 years. Thankfully for now, insects are still the most numerous group of animals on the planet. But will that always be the case? And what do we do to boost populations? Today, we'll be hearing from Dan Boomgart, who's just completed a major study into the ups and downs of the UK's moth populations over the past 50 years. Kelly Jowlett, a PhD student who's looking at beneficial insects for crops, and we're also going to meet her beetle, which I'm very excited about. And first, I'm going to be joined by Dr. James Bell, head of the Rothamsted Insect Survey. Now, James got lost with me earlier, so I'm going to invite James to the stage and hopefully he will turn up in a second. Wonderful. James, can you hear us? <laughs> yes, uh, it's great to be on the right stage right now. <laughs> I know we were just talking to each other with no audience, but I'm glad I'm glad we've both relocated. So, James, as I mentioned, you're head of the Inset Survey at Rothamsted Research. So, tell us a bit about it. How does it work? Sure. So, um, I'm head of the Inset Survey, as you say. Uh, we've been uh, working on uh, monitoring and surveillance of insects since 1964. So coming up for 60 years. Uh, and what we do is we have two trap networks. Uh, we have the light traps that look at the uh, nocturnal phase, if you like, of insect movement, but also the suction traps that record uh, aphids and other insects too. And just tell me kind of practically how you do an insect survey. How on earth do you count insects? Okay, so, so let's just start with a suction trap network. So think of an upside down hoover about 12.2 meters high, 16 of those across the UK, covering an area each of around 80 kilometers, informing farmers in that region. And uh, what happens is it is continually sucking insects down into a chamber where they're collected at the bottom in a pot. And those insects are then posted, it's very old school, very posted to Rotham's edge. And I've got a team of entomologists um, who work on those samples and push that information out to the farming community. We use various devices. Uh, one of our new ones is SMS messaging to farmers, as well as using insectsurvey.com, where you can see a whole host of data. The light traps work differently. It's largely a volunteer network, and um, we monitor moths and other insects, such as caddis flies, uh, and we have those held in a database. And the database is proves really useful for policy making and also sending information out to, 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 to the academic community. And what kind of species do you look at and do they act as a kind of proxy for other species or is it just telling us about the ones that you're catching? So that's a really good question. We, we, we of course, I mean, let's just go back to the beginning. We started in the 1960s uh, because of the overuse of insecticides. And you may remember a book by Rachel Carson called Silent Spring that highlighted the issues of overuse of insecticides such as DDT. And it was Rothamsted staff who thought that 
uh, they can make a difference to the uh, to the way in which agri agriculture proceeded. And so what they did is they um, start to monitor the aphids and send those out to the farming community. But as time has gone on, we're now looking at ladybirds, lacewings, um, we're looking at human uh, disease vectors, such as uh, midges uh, and mosquitoes, potentially, uh, as well as, um, you know, the sort of the cousins of the, the insect world, the spiders. Now, James, I know that our audience will probably have a lot of questions for you, and I have tons more questions for you about yeah. the insect survey. But first, we're actually going to swap to Kelly Rowlett, a PhD student in sustainable agriculture at Rothamsted Research, and we're going yeah. to be meeting her beetle. So, James, we're um, hopefully going to speak to you a little bit later. And, um, Audience, if you have any questions, put them in the chat and we'll try and get to as many as we can later on. But um, Kelly, if you can join us on the stage. Hello, I'm here now. <laughs> Hello, Kelly, it's lovely to meet you. And um, I hear we're also going to have another guest. Got Megan here with me too. <laughs> <laughs> Megan, your beetle. Well, tell me what kind of beetle is that? Well, Megan is a carabid beetle, and the species is Teflus megurlii, and she's from Nigeria. Well, we don't quite have carabids that big in the UK, but we do have 350 species. Now, in my work, I've trapped some of these, and you can see these are the ones that I've got from my samples. And this is about the biggest one that we get in the UK. So not quite as big as Megan, but quite big. <laughs> mm. And how big can beetles get? I mean, do we have ones which are even bigger than Megan? No, not in the UK, but um, in other areas of the world. I think that Megan is one of the biggest of the carabid species. Mm. Um, whereas fruit beetles get a lot bigger, like the one, the Goliath beetles that you mentioned and long Longhorn beetles that burrow into wood, they get quite big too. They're among the biggest. Now, most people, Kelly, would not necessarily think of having a beetle as a pet. I know it may, it may surprise you. So what what is, kind of tell me about having a beetle as, as a pet. What is it like and why do you enjoy um, having Megan around? Well, we, we actually have a few uh, insect pests. In the background you can see a huge caterpillar there that's a death's head hawk moth caterpillar. And it's nice to have them around because you do understand more about how they live, how they behave. Um, you can show a video because you actually see how Megan predates on snails, if we can show the video. Yes, I think um, hopefully our tech support will be able to show Not this. Oh, that, that's just me holding Megan, there's a different one that we're eating there. Now, so it really gets in there. <laughs> one of the things that I found amazing about this video is it, it looks as if she's sort of chewing. Is that right? Is she kind of really chewing down on the snail or? Yes, the, the carabids have this very narrow, if I can get her in the shot like that, that, these ones that predate on snails have very narrow heads so they can get right down into the snail there. And you can see, I hope you can just see her very big jaws there, her mandibles yeah. that she uses to, to kind of scoop out the insides of the snails. Now, if anyone watching wants to see Kelly and Megan a little bigger, you can click on her video feed and it should make that bigger. And then if you want to minimise, you can click on it again. So if anyone wants to have a really good look at that beetle. Now... Moving on to your research, Kelly, as I mentioned, um, one of the things that you do is look at beneficial insects. Um, so tell me about your work and what you study. So I study the UK carabids, so of the same genus as um, Megan here, but the UK ones. Like I said, there's over 350 species in the UK and about 30 of those are common in farmland and they're predatory but um, they predate on a range of insect pests. So going from um, slugs and snails, such as these kind of carabids would predate on, to aphids even, which uh, vectors of crop disease, um, caterpillars, weevils, 
they're pretty much scavengers that eat anything that's in the crop area. But one thing that not a lot of people realize is that they also eat weed seeds. Um, they can eat up to 4,000 weed seeds per meter squared per day in a crop area. So that is quite a lot of competition with the crop that they are potentially taking away. Mm. And, you know, how viable is it to use carabid beetles, you know, perhaps not as a, as a replacement for pesticides, but maybe alongside other methods um, to kind of keep our crop pests under control? I mean, I can imagine a lot of people might be quite fearful of armies of beetles running through the British countryside. Well, there'd have to be enough for them to eat, to be armies. So if we had a pet problem that big, I think we'd be glad of the beetles, really. But um, the, that's one of the things that my work is hoping to address, that we don't have quantification of the pre predation that they carry out that's informative for policymakers at the moment. I mean, I pitfall trap in fields to get the data on the, the distributions of beetles and I, I get cupfuls like pint cupfuls of beetles in the field and when farmers see that when they see how many are in the crop areas it's very persuasive over how much they will actually take out of of insect pests in the crop so I'm trying to quantify this and, and build it in so that we can inform how to work together with IPM methods and use uh, pesticides more sparingly and um, build in this natural enemy pest control, as we call it. So um, this method would be a little bit kind of its more targeted approach. Yes, what I'm trying to do with my work is figure out what management we can put in as, as um, land managers, as farmers, to encourage the beetles into actual crop areas. So we do know that putting grassy margins at the sides of fields will boost carabids. But how we put them in, what kind of things we involve in the margins and where we put them in juxtaposition with other landscape features, um, will affect whether the carabids move into the crop and at what time uh, and following which pests. And the s different species will eat different things. So Megan will just eat snails and slugs, but different species that are smaller may eat the aphids. So you want the right species in the right place at the right time. So that's, that's what I'm trying to work towards, knowing what farmers can do to encourage the, the actual targeted um, application. Mm. And so Megan there, she we saw her eating snails. Um, does she does she eat slugs too? Could we use her in a, in you know our, our gardens uh, amongst our cabbages to <laughs> suffer eating our crops? Potentially, potentially on a on a nice uh, warm day, but she doesn't like it too cold because she's she's actually from Nigeria, so she's used to the warm climate. I have to keep her quite warm in the house. Oh, so I'm going to snail in the garden and bring them in for her. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, we've got some audience questions to... for you. Oh, sorry, do carry on, Kelly. Yes, the native carabids will will take care of these slugs and snails. So this, uh, this carabid, carabus violaceus, the violet ground beetle, that eats snails in your garden. So you, you want that one to come in and help you out. And what could we do to encourage uh, beetles in in our garden or even just in the in the countryside? Well, it's including grassland is. Pre I'm here. Are we still? Hello. I think we got cut off for a minute there. Back again. <laughs> about how um, how we might encourage the beetles. Yes, grassland's been shown to be very, very beneficial, like I said, with the field margins with tusky grasses. So the tusky grasses help them to overwinter. So those overwintering permanent habitats are very important in farmland, but also in your gardens. Having scruffy, scrubby areas in your garden with wildflower resources will give the beetles somewhere to hide alternative food sources when you haven't got your, uh, the pests about so that they can survive the winter because they do hibernate like like, um, like mammals. The beetles do hibernate over winter when there's no pests for them to eat. So they need somewhere to do that. 
And we've got a, a, a few listener questions for us. Um, so thank you guys for sending those in. So the first one is from Lynn Westcott, and she said, Megan is lovely. What genus does she belong to? She's a Teflus Megurlii. A Teflus Megurlii. Well, yeah. that's <laughs> a difficult one to say. And Alexandra Shaw asked us, do pesticides also inadvertently kill the carabid beetles? Um, yes, it depends very much on the pesticide, the specifics. Um, most of them. Carabids are quite uh, resistant to pesticide direct mortality, but they, they, it does affect them in the behaviours, in the feeding behaviours and breeding. Uh, pesticides. So it's more these kind of subtle ones that, that um, do cause declines in the populations. So. Brilliant. Well, Kelly, uh, we have got some more audience questions, but I'm hoping we can return to those at the end because um, we are now going to um, go back to our question of insecticides, which, of course, your work is um, helping to us to understand better and to look at. And so, um, Kelly, thank you for joining us on stage and perhaps we'll get you back at the end to answer a few more questions about fantastic Megan and your, your fascinating <laughs> work. But um, now... Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so now we're going to um, watch a video that uh, PhD student Dan Blumgart has provided for us and he's going to be talking about his research here at Rothamsted and he is something called a quantitative moth ecologist and that means that he is measuring populations of moths and he's been looking at data from the past 50 years. So we've now got, or we should have now, a uh, video of Dan explaining a little bit more about his research. What we, what we have here is the world's longest running moth trap. So how does it work? This light sensor detects when it's got dark. It turns the light bulb on. The moths fly in here down this glass funnel and are collected in this glass jar down here. Every morning, we collect the jar and we identify the moths and count them. This trap began running in 1933. It ran through the 30s and the 40s, excluding the war years. It stopped running for the whole of the 50s. When the researchers restarted it again in the 1960s, they found something disturbing. The number of moths they were catching had declined by 71%. So what had caused this decline? Well, in the 1950s, the UK underwent an agricultural revolution. Widespread mechanization of farming resulted in habitat loss and the introduction of synthetic pesticides. These findings inspired the launch of the Rothamsted Insect Survey Light Trap Network. Traps like this were installed all across the country. And since the 1960s, we found that moth abundance has declined by a further 30% at least. And the decline is worse in the south, where declines are over 40%. My PhD was partly to try and find out what had caused these declines. I initially thought that the continued agricultural intensification since the 1960s was to blame. But when I looked at moth trends in separate habitats, I found something surprising. And that was that in farmland, the declines had actually been the least severe. The most severe declines had actually been in semi-natural habitats, such as in woodlands. This means that just over half the moths present in these habitats in the 1960s have disappeared. So what's caused this decline in woodlands? Let's go over to our woodland trap on site to have a look. We are now standing in Geescroft Wood. This is a 140-year-old woodland, and the moth trend since the 1960s is typical for southern woodlands, with a decline of around 50%. The amount of woodlands in the UK has actually increased since the 1960s, meaning that direct habitat loss is unlikely to blame for the decline. Woodlands are also more buffered from effects such as light pollution and pesticides. What is causing the decline? One hypothesis involves a, an often overlooked cause of biodiversity loss, and that is overgrazing by deer. The number of deer in the UK has gone up and up since the 1960s and is now thought to be higher than at any point since the last ice age. Overgrazing by deer damages the understory. That's the plants that grow on the ground level up to about two meters in height. Overgrazing by deer is known to have negative effects on woodland birds and the same could be true of moths. 
In addition, uh, woodlands like this are no longer coppiced or harvested for timber. That means that they've become more shaded and prevented light reaching the woodland floor, which also means the understory struggles to grow. In my PhD, the evidence for deer overgrazing as a driver of moth decline was inconclusive, but I think that this should be looked into as an avenue of research regarding moth declines in the UK. So far, this has all been bad news, but there is good news too. To show you, I'll take you back to the first trap. Earlier I told you that over the 1950s, moth abundance had declined by over 70% at this site. In the early 60s, this landscape was very different. This hedgerow was not here, and this meadow was all an arable field. Since the 1960s, this hedgerow has regenerated and this meadow has developed, vastly increasing the amount of food plants available for moths. As a result, the number of moths caught at this site has almost doubled since the 1960s. Another good news story we found looking at the long-term data is that moths whose larvae that feed on lichen have exploded in number. This is almost certainly due to legislation beginning with the Clean Air Act of 1956. Lichens grow better in clean air and hence provide more food to the moths that eat them. These examples demonstrate that habitat creation and restoration coupled with good environmental regulation may save the moths yet. What we have here. Fascinating. So that was a um, overview of Dan's research and I'm glad to say that we've got the live version of Dan with us now. <laughs> Hello. I'm sorry, I've joined too early. Hello. No, that's perfect. Thank you very much for um, joining us. And your video was really fascinating. Now, um, one of the questions that kind of occurred to, to me was, um, you know, we're, your work is helping us understand moth populations and, and why it might be changing. But why are moths so important? Why do we need moths? Uh, so mo moths are a really important part of the, the ecosystem in general. And they're, they're a really important link in the food chain. They're, they're really, a really important food source for birds and bats and small mammals. Uh, and they eat a lot of plants. So they're a, a big, uh, they're a way of turning plants into, into the, the higher up the food chain. Uh, they're also pollinators for, um, wildflowers. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the main reason. So, I mean, they play, um, by the sounds of things, an awful lot of important roles in our ecology and also for our agriculture. And as you said, it seems like from your research, um, you know, there have been these these major declines in moth populations. And I was very surprised to hear that one of the reasons may be over grazing from deer. I mean, is this the case with all moth populations that we've seen a, a decline across species or is it the picture a little bit more complicated than that? Um, yeah, so I tried to, in my PhD, I looked into, into the idea that maybe moths that feed on on the understory in the woodland had declined more than moths that feed on the like the tall trees, but but I didn't find that. So the the decline in woodland is 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 really quite mysterious. So I'm tr I'm trying to look into that more. At the, at the moment, the deer the deer, deer grazing is just a hypothesis that I think we should look into. Mm. And um, thank you very much for telling us about your research. And I think um, if you stay on the stage, Dan, and we're also going to inv um, invite James back too. Um, so, James, if you can join us on the stage and I can ask you both a little bit about um, insect surveys. Now, um, James, perhaps we'll start with you. Mm -hmm. um, I want to know what are some of the complications and challenges of running an insect survey? Well, I mean, if you want to know about challenges, just take this year. You know, COVID has is, is been difficult for everyone and we've tried to, but, you know, pests don't recognise COVID and to monitor them is really still a very important so, you know, keeping the traps running, keeping people involved in servicing the traps, in collecting the material, in identifying the material, that's one of the, the major challenges this year. But also long term funding. You know, we've been lucky that we have BBSRC support for our research. But, you know, in the tropics uh, where we know very little, there's almost nothing done. No money is going towards monitoring those. And yet, you know, every year we lose uh, 10 million uh, hectares of forest and we don't know what impact that's having. 
And that kind of takes me on to the next question there. You mentioned, you know, the tropics and the fact that perhaps we don't really understand what's going on there. And I mean, what does uh, both of your research tell us about this, you know, very terrifying prediction of a insect Armageddon? Hmm. Maybe, Dan, do you want to shoot with that one or shall I take that? Uh, well, yeah, well, so the, the idea that insects are going to go extinct in the next few decades is is, is wrong. Like in, insects are incredibly adaptable in this and there's a lot of them. And and also there are, there are groups of insects that aren't declining. Like there are there are meta studies that come from like the USA that shows insects have been stable overall. Like some some have declined seriously, but then others have, have increased. Um, like for example, in the UK, climate, climate change has, has actually allowed moth populations to expand northwards, and, and in that way, some some moths are actually doing very well. So so there are there are declines in in some groups and. And there's no doubt there are fewer insects now than there were in previous decades and in previous centuries. But the idea that they're going to go extinct is is not true. Now, I do want to take some audience questions because we we have a couple. But just before we do that, um, I want to ask uh, James, perhaps, you know, um, what can people do at home, whether it's um, helping to boost insect populations or even just getting involved in the insect surveys themselves? Absolutely. So there's lots of uh, volunteer schemes. You can become a, uh, a recorder of insects with your uh, counter recorder. So whatever it takes your fancy. A lot of people start with butterflies. It's a good place to start because they're fairly easy. There's not too many species. But, uh, you know, this year in, in lockdown, we, we did an experiment at home. And I think that's, that might inspire others. Is that we, we decided not to cut a quarter of our lawn and just to leave it. And it was a remarkable little experiment because what we saw growing in our garden from what was, we thought, just grass, was yarrow, uh, which fed um, many insects, including butterflies and had visitors of uh, you know, flies and other moths, and lovely little grasses that were providing food for those herbivores. So if you know you do one thing, just consider cutting less of your lawn, but also think about the wider impacts, the global impacts. You know, I talked about deforestation. The reason why that is going at such a fast rate is because of three things. Uh, beef production, palm oil, and soybean. Often the soybeans used to feed the cattle. Consider where you buy your food from, because if you look at the 5.5 million insects that are estimated to be on this planet, many of those live in forests. So if you have, if you, if you make um, some choices about where you take your uh, food products from, uh, then you can have an impact um, on those uh, forests. I mean, hopefully we can have enough for, for hundreds of years to, or thousands of years to come. Well, any excuse not to mow my lawn, I will certainly take. <laughs> now, we do have some audience questions. And um, the first one is from Sandy Tandbridge. And um, she asked Dan, what's the most common moth that you found? Uh, so in, in the network, the most common moth is the Hebrew character. So that's a, a small, it's a medium sized noctuid that comes out early in the season. And it's named because it has a mark on its wing, which looks like a character from the Hebrew alphabet. Um, and so if, if you get into moths, some, something that you'll find is they have quite quirky names. But that's one of the reasons I recommend getting into moths. <laughs> I think I've, I've experienced the same thing with butterflies. I, I think that, that whoever's naming them is inspired, certainly. And one of the one of the questions that I think probably occurs to a lot of people driving around their own personal experience is a question from Christopher Woolwork, who asks, has anyone assessed the level of impact on insect populations from those splattered by cars and other road vehicles? I'm sure people have had the experience of going fast down a motorway and ending up with quite a lot of bugs on the windscreen. And he wondered if reductions in road traffic this spring due to COVID might have actually helped. Hmm. Yeah, so... That's okay, there, thanks. Yeah, there's a, there has been a really... Uh, so there's been a lot of... Um, sort of ad hoc data collected. And certainly as an individual, I know uh, that my car uh, records less insects, but I also know about my car that it's changed its aerodynamic shape, which means that more insects won't intercept it. There's a really good study um, uh, recently done looking at you know, the, the, um, the number of insects spattered on a windscreen and that it, whether the number of insects on those windscreens 
actually reflects changes in the bird population. And they found a good correlation that actually the windscreen was a good estimate uh, of insect numbers. And that decline recorded over time on windscreens related to the decline in birds. So we need more information, of course, and there are many other uh, drivers we need to understand. We haven't yet talked about light pollution, um, but you know, um, change is happening all around us. And these sort of proxies like windscreen are useful, but we have to interpret them with care. Now, we only have a few minutes left, but we did get a question from uh, Kirsten Durs about light pollution, which you just mentioned. Yeah. And she said, you know, there are many different reasons uh, due for insect decline, but what is the impact of light pollution? Yeah, so um, you can help with this one, Dan. Okay. Well, yeah, there, there's been there's been quite a few studies looking at the impacts of light pollution. They've they found it, it disrupts mating, uh, disrupts feeding, um, also ca causes direct mortality by, by the moths flying into the light and getting stuck, or just um, reducing fitness by distracting the insects from doing what they need to do in life. It's, it's hard to measure the exact contribution of light pollution to the whole decline, but it's, it's certainly having an effect. Yeah, but I would add also that, you know, um, you've got to understand the wavelength of light as well. So there, you know, wavelength of light is really important. So um, the, the smaller wavelength around um, three or 400 nanometers is perhaps more attractive for some insects than others. And our, also our infrastructure is changing around us. So we're moving away from those yellow lamps to LED lamps in, in our streets. We don't quite know yet um, how those should be structured. And that's some of the work that we're doing here at Rotham Said in collaboration with, with Exeter, as well as others around uh, the UK. So it, it is an important topic. Now, with just about a minute to go, um, we've had a very popular question from Sadina Thapper. So thank you for sending that in, asking about local councils and um, whether we should stop mowing and regulating green public spaces and maybe let them go a little bit wild. Yes, definitely. I, th I think so. Yeah, yeah. Road, roadside verges, parks. I think definitely where 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 it's where you can do it. I think you should let let it grow long. Yeah. And so could I just also say, so Patricia, with the the tree planting thing. Um. So should we include coppicing? I I personally think it would be really cool to introduce large large herbivores into the new woodlands. Like if if you look up the Nep estates, they've they've got a a re rewilding project looking at the effect of large herbivores, uh, pigs. And um, kind of things like that on on woodland, and it, it's really incredible what what it does to woodland biodiversity, having the young sh scrub layer. Yeah, fascinating. Well. I'll leave it there as we're running out of time. But Dan and James, thank you so much for joining us on the stage. And Kelly for uh, bringing along her beetle, Megan, which was fascinating. I'm sorry for all the questions that we didn't quite manage to get to today. Um, there were some really great ones. And uh, a whistle-stop tour through insect decline and uh, measuring insects. So thanks to all of the, those who have joined us for this session. And hopefully many of you will also join us for some of the other sessions in Rothamsted Research's room. There are two this afternoon that I'm going to be at and we're going to be discussing the promise of genetically modified foods, which is definitely going to be a fascinating conversation. And we're going to be looking at grasslands where uh, we'll be digging into soil, cow nutrition and turning livestock into wheat farms. So I hope to see you then. Um, hopefully you can come back to the room and keep a look out for keep a look out for Rothamsted Research is session. And if you are interested in Dan and James and Kelly's research, I encourage you to head over to Rothamsted Research's website where you can read all about them, maybe even read one of their papers. I can't think of anything better to do on a Saturday afternoon. Um, and I hope all of you feel very inspired to um, look after the insects and uh, leave your lawns and leave plant some lawn. trees. So, <laughs> Thank you both for joining us. Cheers, bye-bye. Thank you, bye.